So thank you all for coming, being here today. My name is Yasser Jian. I'm the technical director at DeadMage. We make all kind of, kinds of games. This is a talk about an efficient, this is my idea of an efficient runtime type system for C++. It's, uh, I mostly cover PODs. Uh, this is not a deep dive into implementation stuff. There's no time for that, so I apologize. There's also no type theory here. There's no computer science stuff. And unfortunately, I have to use many words in many meanings, type, enumeration, class, runtime, compilation, stuff like that. So I apologize again if the meaning is, some, is not clear somewhere. So what do we mean by a runtime type system and what we wish for it to do for us? First of all, the primary features of a type system, a runtime type system, would be introspection. We need to be able to enumerate all types in the system, all traits and attributes of those types, their sizes, their concrete types, their relationship to each other, if there are composite types, their fields, their members, their elements, stuff like that. We need to access those values, those instances, those members and fields. We ideally would need to be able to instantiate those types, those types that we may need to have to be able to composite at, composite at, at runtime, to be able to define new types and then instantiate them and then have access to their metadata. And the, se the secondary features would be things like serialization, easy serialization, easy ability to generate GUIs and uh, property editors and stuff like that. Uh, things like sending messages over the network and have the data describe itself. Have the data description with the, the, along with the data. We might need to be able to do type massaging, what I call type massaging, to, to be able to convert values and instances of similar types to each other. Maybe for backward compatibility as our data structures evolve over time, we need to be able to upconvert or uh, uh, read the old data, but have the new data instead. And of course, this is game development, so our non-functional requirement would be efficiency, definitely, uh, in both memory and CPU. We, ne we would need as low as possible overhead on each instance, as low as possible overhead on access to the values. If we can get it, we need type safety. If we are defining a type, we're putting values in, and there are integers, we would like to add no when, when we are reading them wrong, reading them at floats, as floats, and things like that. And of course, ease of use is also a large factor here. I've tried to, in, in, the, in my idea here, in my system I'm proposing here, I've tried to really, it, I'm, I've tried to make the system easy to use, and you'll see that, hopefully. So common techniques used for, to have uh, runtime type systems, to so have data that uh, we don't know their type at compile time, to, have, to work with data that we don't know their exact concrete types at compile time. Uh, most, uh, most of us would go to tables of strings, tables of a string to a string, key value tables, or if you are a little bit more sophisticated, we would use a some type like any variant, tagged unions, things like that. Uh, essentially an implementation of JSON in C++. Data that has, each piece of data has its type with it. We would uh, use that, that's easy to use, that's familiar, that's horribly inefficient. There are systems, uh, serialization systems and metadata, type metadata systems that depend on uh, template and macro magic, like uh, boost serialization if you have used it, or boost HANA, it has a lot of metaprogramming, template metaprogramming and macro metaprogramming uh, facilities that you can use to enumerate types. You use these systems at compile time but generate data that would, you would use at runtime. These are uh, very complicated. There are uh, techniques based on domain specific preprocessors like Qt's uh, meta object compiler you put in special macros in your code, special tags in your code, and then you run it through a preprocessor and it generates a lot of the re required code for you before you actually give the code to a compiler, to a C++ compiler. 
And of course, the most sophisticated of these systems are based on interface description languages and full-on, full-blown code generation like uh, Protobuf or Thrift or Cap'n Proto, stuff like that. These are, uh, well, very useful, but we're not going to use them. Uh, what I'm uh, describing here will not use code generation. Uh, code generation is fine, but that's depending on a things like a thing like protobuf is maybe a large dependency. And if we can get away with not doing code generation, our build process, our programming process would be simpler. We would keep our code in one language not using another tool in the tool chain. It's not really wrong, but it's just a little simpler not to do that. Uh, we're not going to use any pre-processing of source code apart from simple macros used for convenience, simple C macros, not any specialized preprocessor. That usually leads to ugly, error-prone, opaque, just code that are a lot of hacks in it, doesn't work with uh, many lang some language features. For example, that Q thing I mentioned does not work with template cl class templates. So you can't have Q object template classes, children of Q object that are templated. Uh, and I've tried to stay away from template and macro magic as much as possible. There is templates in there. There is macro in there. But there's no meta programming things that would affect the end user code, the end user experience. Again, that leads to very bad cases of getting a compiler that you don't know what's going on. If you have used those systems, if you have used boost serialization, for example, you know what I'm talking about. And template metaprogramming is notoriously slow to compile. Uh, what we are going to strive for is to have a system that is as close to as close to C structs as possible. C structs are fast. C structs are really efficient in memory. The C, C structs are familiar, but C structs do not have any uh, introspection features. Not even at compile time, you just can get their size, nothing else. Uh, so we are going. We are here to add those features. We are going to build a system that has those features. So the basis of this system would be defining new types at runtime. We're not going to be adding metadata to existing types. We are going to compose new types at runtime, and we are going to build a, the usage of this system would be to build a whole, whole new type system at runtime, but uh, with hopefully good uh, efficiency characteristics. Uh, we're going to aim for having similar complexity of uh, defining types, write a similar amount of code, not the same code that you would write to define a struct, but we're going to try to have similar amount of code to define a struct. If you write a struct with three fields in four lines in C, uh, our system would have this, um, about the same amount of code, not 400 lines of code to define a simple struct. If we can support structs, fixed size arrays, more on this later, uh, fixed size homogeneous arrays, and enumerations and primitive scalar types, we would probably cover a lot of the use cases that we would run in every day. Uh, since we are building our types at runtime, introspection is not really difficult. We are defining, I'm, I'm going to show you the syntax, so I'm going to show you the usages and uh, make it more concrete, but if you are defining the types at runtime using that data, introspection is not really difficult. If I'm saying, if I'm telling, if I'm specifying that I have an struct with three float fields with x and y and z, names x and y and z, then there's not much to introspection. I just keep that data around and whenever I want to iterate over the fields of that structure, I just iterate over the data that I use to define the struct. Uh, essentially, uh, we are going to describe the data and then have a compilation step for our types. We're going to describe the types and then compile the 
description into something that is efficient and more usable and workable, we, we can work with. Uh, at this compilation step, we are gathering uh, information like sizes, fields, orders, alignments, uh, offsets, uh, and that kind of information about each field, each piece of data, and each uh, member, and then use that for introspection. Uh, we also, in, in this system, I also hash the type definition. We'll see why, why that's useful. I hash the whole type definition. Uh, it is useful because I can uh, detect collisions in the, I can detect du duplicate types. Uh, this, if you define the same type again, that's just fine. You're going to this, get the same definition, the same runtime definition for the old type that you used. If you define the same struct with the same fields and the same types, Multiple times, you are going to get the same type, and they would, uh, their type would be equivalent. You can.
examples you'll see later for brevity. There are five categories of types. These five categories are uh, basic types, uh, enumeration, enums, arrays, structs, and special types that I'll talk about. Basic types are what you would uh, expect. These are scalar types. These are sized, int, float, unsigned, bool, car. Uh, there are 12 or 15 of them. You can add your own. Uh, you can change the library to add your own if you have an implementation of this library. Uh, these are types that have a direct correspondent in C. That a U8 in uh, die struct is the same thing as an unsigned char or U in 8 underline T in C. We know everything about these basic types. Enumerations come in four sizes, with enum 8 to enum 64, because, well, enumerations are different in size. Uh, arrays have two variations. There are arrays of basic types, which are simple arrays, and arrays of uh, more complex types, which are array complex. There is a struct type in die struct. Of course, special types are special types are padding and tag. Padding is used inside structs to to fix the alignment of fields, and tags are uh, types with no values with zero size that you can add to structs to augment their, to augment them. For example, if you have a uh, vector tree, which I said before, it's a, it has x, y, z. Now, if you want to store a normalized vector, you can have the same structure with x, y, and z fields, but you can add a tag to it that says normalized. This, this structure would be different from the old structure. Their IDs, their fingerprints, their hashes will be different, so you can uh, massage the data when you want to convert between them. They won't just convert transparently. If, uh, you have, if you've used these kinds of systems, this is uh, also very, fairly common, maybe. Good feature to have. So this is the sample. This is some sample. Uh, you uh, use uh, subclasses of type die decal to declare types. Uh, as a side note, this, li this library does not use, my implementation of this solution does not use any uh, polymorphism or inheritance at run at access in accessors at the, the part of runtime that is uh, perhaps performance critical. But uh, declaration, type declaration is easier this way. So there are four children types for decal. There is basic decal, struct decal, array decal, and enum decal, of course. Uh, decal types, uh, decals, are uh, abstract classes that have information to gather metadata about the type. Their size, their actual type, uh, and elements, children, if they have it. You can compile the type using the decal interface. And you can visit uh, both the type and the inst and instances of that type using this interface. Visiting is like enumer enumerating the type and fields, enumerating the data. I use visitors to generate the hash, for example, or do serialization, do serialization of the type definition, which is important, and do serialization of the data, which is also <laughs> important. There is the concept of a type registry. A, a type registry is the universe of types that work with each other. You can have, obviously, multiple type registries, but that they would be separate. Uh, this is how you define a type registry. You create a declaration. You compile the declaration through the registry. This is declaration for a U8 does not need any, any extra information. You can alternatively use these syntaxes to Compile the types. These are convenience features that would make more sense in uh, more complex types, as, as we will see in later slides. I use mostly the last syntax. You just create a temporary declaration and then, then, then compile it on the same line. These, uh, the compile operation returns a compiled type, a pointer to a compiled type that is stored inside the registry. Array declaration, simple array declaration is uh, done specifying number of items and 
uh, type of each item, and it also returns a compiled type. There is no a hierarchy of compiled types. There is only one compiled type. So the, the, there is no virtual functions there. This is another an example of a struct. Uh, start with a struct decal. It can uh, optionally accept a padding value. You can pad each field of the struct to uh, the alignment of each field of the struct to four bytes, eight bytes, whatever you want. This is mainly to be uh, in some really performance sensitive areas of our code or mainly to stay uh, compatible with C structs. You add, base, uh, you add fields to a struct declaration. Here I've added three fields of type float they're named X, Y, and Z, and I've compiled them here and stored the compiled type. I've not stored, in most of these examples, I'm not store, storing the declaration anywhere. But the comp compiled type is aware of its declaration. You can add aliases to types, like you see here. So you can name your types, actually. The, the, the above procedure, the, the compiling procedure, does not generate any name for the type. But uh, you can add aliases easily. This is a sample of a complex array, an array that is using a type by its ID. You can also put type alias, type name here as well. It requires the footprint, the size of each, each its element. The declaration is, is, is separate. Declaration is separate from the registry, so it, it cannot look up the size of types from the registry. Uh, error, checking, um, error checking is done at compile time for each type. We can declare the array here and then compile it or do the As an example, it has two basic fields and then an enumeration which is aligned at two bytes. The enumeration, the array is aligned at four, but uh, there is an explicit declaration of a simple array here. There's a tag Wednesday. This struct is tagged Wednesday for some reason. And there's a, there's a struct field in it too. As you can see, you can compose your data structures like this. If you start with, uh, if you can work with plain old data type, fixed size, plain old data, data, data you can uh, probably define your whole data structure like this. There are no unions here and there are no bit fields, but bit fields are easy to add or easy to not have and unions are a whole different matter. Unions are not hard either. Okay, so instantiation. Compile types, they know they store a reference to their registry, they store the reference to the declaration, they know their type size, uh, anything they can know about themselves and their elements or the, their fields. They can enumerate their fields, they can instantiate themselves and destroy instances of themselves and the uh, structures, uh, the structure that I use to point to uh, instances of die structs is the PTR, the putter that you see there. It has a data pointer, a, it could be void pointer, but that's e this is easier, and a pointer to its compiled type. When you are trying to access the instance, you go through the data pointer. When you are trying to access metadata, you are trying to enumerate uh, metadata of that type, you go through the type and all the information is there. I have uh, experimented with is storing more data in the putter, but uh, storing things like complete size, complete footprint, in memory, number of elements of an array, but that's a trade-off you might want to do, but I, I'm fine with this. There are 
functions to, because I'm using these functions later, I'm writing them here. They're instantiate functions and functions to instantiate and destroy. And they would take and return what you would expect. Putters are value types. I pass them around as values. They're 16 bytes on a 64-bit architecture. So not much overhead there. And the, these two lines are equivalent again. You can instantiate using the compile type or pass the compile type to the free function, the free uh, top level instantiate function. Okay, now on to access. So the accessor objects I talked about before live in the ACC namespace, accessor namespace. I've uh, if the names of the types and stuff in this library are long, it's, it kind of negates the whole point. So um, maybe you're not, you do not agree with me, but I've tried to keep the names short. Names of the, at least the namespace and type names. So the simplest accessor is a basic direct accessor. It's a direct accessor to an instance of a basic type. Not inside a struct, not inside an array, not an enumeration, just an instance of a basic type, a float, for example. The whole implementation of the accessor is here. You just, it is templated on the type code. This is an enumeration, the type is an enumeration. U8, F64, things like that. It's templated on this, and um, all of, most of the accessors have their function call operator overloaded. It helps with the syntax, as we see down there. Uh, the parent operator is overloaded, so it takes a pointer, which is the instance we want to access, and returns a, the actual type, the actual based on the enumeration type, the actual concrete C type of the data. This cast function is a, is a there's a bit of template magic, not magic, but template sleight of hand here. It's fairly common in C++, in, well, C++, in modern C++. And it translates a type, a enumeration type to an actual type and does the, a reinterpret cast. There are, uh, there, there are error checking code in here that I've omitted. There are macros, there are uh, assert macros here to check the validity of the type. There's, there are static asserts in the struct definition to check whether this is actually a basic type, this T that you're passing in, uh, to check whether P has the same type as T, things like that. They can be turned off in my implementation, but they're not there in release anyway, in optimized builds. So we declare, we de declare a, the most basic type, a, one, a byte. This is a byte, and we create an accessor to it. The basic direct accessor has no parameters, nothing, just a, an accessor to a U8, a byte. Accessors are type dependent, but instance independent. They do not depend on the instance. They work, they are not created for a specific instance of a type. They're created for the type. So I can access any U8 with this accessor. I instantiate a byte, two bytes, A and B. And then the syntax of using that would be V of A. I've named it V, so you can say V of A. V of A 42 or V of B is equal, equals two times V of A. And this is, this is in place of uh, A equals 42, which we have had to type three more characters here. It is better for struct access. There is only two, one extra character there for those. But here, we are accessing a plain variable. You have to pay.
create an accessor over. It looks up the member. This operation just goes over an array, finds the member. Uh, I have two overloads of operator paren. The second one is for performance for access inside arrays. I'll talk about that later, maybe. I have an example over the, for this. It only stores the offset. The same cast is performed here for bookkeeping of types. There are a lot of asserts here as well. I'm, I've omitted those asserts for the slides. Just, we just have to do one add. This add is a add. These are register ads, if you're lucky, if your compiler can generate the correct code, that offset should be stored in register, especially if you are using these accessors in a loop. That offset is, if you're lucky, is stored in register, and this is, and the pointer is probably stored in register too, so this is a, this is still one lookup through two registers with a base and offset register. So, an x64 architecture can do that easily. I'll talk about this later, but if you have a lot of register pressure, in a comp you're using this in a complex code, maybe that's not always in register. That, that is the cost we are incurring over traditional arrays. Traditional arrays, traditional structs have their offset hard coded at compile time. That's just an immediate embedded in the instruction itself. But here, uh, the compiler does not know the offset at compile time, so it has to fetch it from somewhere. If you're lucky, it is in a register. And you use that accessor like this. Uh, my type die my type is a compiled struct. It has a foo field. I create an accessor, a basic member accessor of type i32 to the foo field of die my type. This accessor is again independent from any instance of this type. It's just specific to that member of this type. So you can use it for any access to the member foo member name foo in the uh, struct die my type. So you instantiate it, and you write it like this. Instead of x.foo equals 7, you write foo of x equals 7. The close parent is the extra character you have to type, open parent and dot. They're interchangeable. So you can read and write it. This is maybe more mathematical notation of writing access to properties of an object. Anyway. Uh, I. I really like this, this syntax. This is probably what drove the whole uh, design of the this, this, uh, library or whatever, <laughs> this syntax. To be able to say foo of x, not something complicated and long. Just use it as an instruct. And still keep having, being, being able to keep performance uh, overhead to a minimum and memory overhead to a minimum is nice. Array accesses are a little more compli complicated. To you don't index to a die struct array. You create an iter accessor, an iter accessor, basic iter accessor that can iterate over the array. Has pointer arithmetic syntax, uh, and you can. It has also the paren operator overloaded, so. An iter named i, you just write i of a. There are examples in the following slides. Uh, it can do and it will do bounce checking if you enable the flag, the preprocessor macro. It can tell you if you are going outside of the loop for for loops, for example, in the conditions of for loops, it has an in function. Uh, you will see that example later. Enumeration access, enumerator. Access is easy as well. Basic enum accessor just treats enums as an integer. It has it stores the pointer to its compiled type, so it can work with strings as well. You just assign strings to the enum. It looks up whether this string is a value of this enum and finds the value. It's slow, but it's usable. Vice and vice versa, you can convert the value of an enum into a string. It's faster and useful. There's typed enum, that type enum, typed enum accessor that would, uh, that is templated on, an, on a C++ enum type that would uh, transparently convert to that 
if you're if you're defining an enumeration that is parallel of some uh, existing C++ enumeration or C enumeration, you can use this typed enum. Enums inside structs have member enum and member typed enum. Arrays inside structs, structs inside arrays, they have their own accessors. This is where there, there are many types of accessors. There is a struct iter, there is array iter for arrays inside arrays. But at some point, these, these uh, accessors, these struct iter, array iter, member array, these, are, these return a pointer from their uh, overloaded paren operator, function call operator. They don't return a concrete C type. They return a pointer that can have more accessors applied on top of it. So these are, again, these accessors would be composable. So there's no special type for an array inside the struct, inside another struct, inside an array, inside an in struct somber. You don't have to have a special kind of accessor type for that. Uh, iter accessors uh, return raw pointers from their uh, parent uh, member function. That's for performance reasons. C++ compilers I've, I checked do not do a good job of optimizing that putter instance because that would incur overhead. That's just the state of compiler right now. It sh they should be able to optimize the overhead array, overhead of returning, a, returning two pointers instead of one pointer and just using the first one, but they don't. Uh, the ones I checked don't and the situations I checked. So I've uh, write, written it this way because this is really performance critical, iterating over arrays. That's where most of your data is anyway. That's less safe, this returning the raw pointer, but that's the concession you make to performance. Uh, the accessors I just described are really, uh, they try to be really strict, as strict as they can. They do a lot of assertions. They assert on anything they can. They, uh, based on your, the preprocessor markers you define, they keep maybe a lot of data. Sometimes an accessor, a simple accessor, keeps two pointer type of the elements inside the array that was passed to it. So it can do a lot of checking at access time. But maybe you don't want that. Maybe you are doing that uh, type massaging thing I talked about earlier. If you, you, if you try to look up a foo member in a struct that does not have a foo member, it will probably crash. It will tr trigger an assertion. But there are parallel finder objects, I call them finders, that mm, almost completely uh, directly correspond to most accessor types that are less strict. If you define a finder of a member called foo in a struct that does not have a member called foo, it just happily goes along. And each time you try to read its value, it just gives you a default value. If that's an integer, it would give you a zero. Or you can even specify the default value you want it to pass back. This is used for simpler code to work with types that is unknown to you, types that have changed maybe. They have members removed and added to them, things like that. So I don't have mm, time to go into uh, finders, but here's an example. An example using C struct versus die struct. This is a simple loop. I have defined a pose struct. I've allocated two arrays of size n of pose and then a float. This is my loop. I'm doing something. I'm uh, subtracting the points from each other and then adding all their components for some reason. But I'm doing that. The arrays are all float data in them, 32-bit floats. And for the, for, in, for the inside of this loop, this is the code that uh, my compiler, Visual Studio 2017 Community Edition, with the latest update, I believe, generates for me. This is the loop body only. These four lines uh, turn to these nine simple instructions. Uh, the, compi the compiler is using SSE registers, but this is not SIMD code. Here, these are these offsets, plus four, plus eight, and plus zero up there, are the 
offsets for the X, Y, and Z members of the struct. These are the data the compiler knows where each member of the struct is relative to a pointer to a base instance of that struct. So this is the code that compiler generates. These uh, register references, R14, RSI, are the array. R14 is probably in two and R size in one. Uh, it's just moving, loading, subtracting, loading, subtracting, loading, subtracting, and then adding all, them all together. This is not a complex loop. There are no reason to spill registers to memory, things like that. This is a hopefully fast loop. By the way, the Visual Studio compiler would unroll just the hell out of this loop. It's just, I don't know why, but ah, I, I do know why, but it would unroll it to maybe eight times, 12 times, something like that. I don't know why that many times. Uh, this loop on my machine took one, uh, took 1 point five nanosecond to go uh, through each iteration of this. That includes bookkeeping for the loop and uh, actual computation. Uh, and of course, it, it, I, I did this in a lot of iterations, and the size of the array did not make any change because of the prefetching that the CPU would do. I'm accessing memory fairly or completely linearly, and uh, it doesn't matter if it did not matter if my whole array, whole arrays, fit in L2 cache, L3 cache, or not. The time were the same. Now the same thing in die struct. So this is the setup. It's not ideal, but uh, the, the whole slide, I will go through it. This whole slide is almost basically corresponds to the first line, only the first line, setting up the struct. Because when you define members named x, y, and z into a struct, the compiler already knows how to generate access to those fields. But in die struct, we have to define them and also the array types. This is the whole thing. That's the structure, compile it. That's the position array, n members, n elements, compile it. And that's the distance, or whatever I've called it distance, but it's not a distance. This array and the type. This is a simple array of floats. The accessors to each field of the struct, accessor to each element of the input structures and access to each element of the iterator for the output structure. Because our input and outputs have different sizes and different structures, we cannot different internal structure. We cannot use the same iterator or accessor for them. But we can use the same accessor for uh, both our input arrays, the same accessor i. So i is for input, j is for output, x, y, z are for the fields. And the loop itself, remember, this is the previous slide. This is the loop we used for uh, struct C structs, plain C structs. This is the loop in die struct. The same new calls, for example, any way you want to instantiate your arrays. I wanted to, the, both text boxes to have roughly the same size, so I added the instantiations as well. So this is how you loop. I and J are accessors, but they have pointer-like uh, semantics. You zero them, you check whether J is in, out. Uh, this is how I read it. J is in, out. Uh, accessor J is still inside the out uh, array. It hasn't gone out of it. And then you increment I and J. Each of these increments uh, is a, an actual add. It's not an increment, in, not by one because the size of each member of input structure, our input structs are 12 bytes and output is four bytes. Uh, so it adds a stride to it. The iterators store an offset and a stride to add. I of in two, and so on and so forth. This is how you write, of course, J of out. This is element J of array out. 
And this is the same, uh, the same nine instructions, different memory accesses. The compiler is doing a great job here to in inlining these uh, function calls and the calls inside them. Uh, this, even for this loop, I had to force the compiler to inline some functions. It wouldn't inline them itself. I had to simplify some of my structures so I can get the inlining. It's a, you have to work with the compiler. You have to examine the output assembly code to get the good inlining. So instead of the hard-coded immediate offsets, we have registers here. We, are, we have to go through registers. We have to go through two registers to get to the data we want, the pointer and the offset. And none of, that, none of those are known at compile time, so we have to, use, we have to check them at runtime. I kind of got lucky. This is, a, if I had more accessors in my loop, for example, 10, 12 accessors with different, uh, working on different arrays, I would have run out of registers in x64, and uh, the compiler would have had to spill those registers, and the code would have been slower, and my loop would have been slower. There are ways to, uh, Avoid that to change the structure of your loop, but I'm, I would say that you should not write real performance sensitive code using die strike access. I'm just demonstrating here that die strike can be used to access data with mostly negligible, in most use cases, negligible overhead. So the loop for 100k object n equals n equal 100k is took 1.5 nanoseconds exactly the same time as uh, the struct case. Those registers had no those register accesses had no overhead in this case. If for more data, it had a maybe 30 percent, 33 percent, one third overhead, and that's not that's a that's that was the jump when the structure became larger than the L3 cache. It, it, didn't, uh, it didn't go over that. If I had, if I increased that 10 million to 100 million or a billion, it did not change the relative time. So that loop setup here, I haven't shown the loop setup here. The loop setup is way more complicated in this case. The loop setup in the C struct case, the assembly code for loop setup was rather simple, straightforward except the unrolling part. And, but this case was really complicated. I just, uh, I haven't had time to, dig, to really dig through it uh, to see what happens. But uh, I guess don't use it for real, real performance sensitive code, but 90% of the time, I myself would say that the overhead is completely okay. So, some notes on the whole system, on the design of the whole system. I used 64-bit uh, hash ID values for the structures, and I had synthesized types, synthesized checks for tens of thousands of types, and I used murmur tree hash, and I had no collisions. So, I would say it's safe, but I'm thinking about maybe using a cryptographic hash to be certain, especially if I'm maybe passing messages back and forth to server clients, which cannot change the hash function uh, simply. The registry object owns all the type you compile and uh, add to it. It owns all the objects. There are uh, other compiled types have pointers to de their declarations, have pointers to their subtypes, and all, are do all of those are uh, owned by the registry. And when you destroy the registry, all those are cleaned up. I could have gone with, oh, and accessors, some of the accessors keep pointers to the types, but uh, I could have done reference counting on those types and to figure out when should I release this type, but 
did, didn't uh, seem like worth the, the effort and the overhead. Uh, the registry copies its declarations. When you compile a declaration, uh, for some types, I have to uh, reorder the values. For example, for enumerations, I uh, sort the values for structs. I may have to uh, add some fields for padding. Uh, therefore, the declarations the registry holds are not the same as you have passed it. In effect, you don't need to worry about declarations, the storing declarations. Declarations are transient uh, temporary objects. Uh, whenever I use this, uh, uh, and uh, the way I figure it, is that serializing die struct data is really simple by just dumping the binary representation out to disk or network or whatever. Since you do have the schematic of the data, the metadata, the declaration of the data. You just serialize the declaration and keep that with the serialized data. If I have 100 megs of data, I just write them binary in one write if they're contiguous in memory to disk and just serialize the structure with it too. The structure can be in text. I've written, I've written text serializers and deserializers for the metadata, but I haven't done that for the data itself. I've played with JSON for the data, but I Hey, Jason. So, uh, so that would be a good uh, way to use this. If you want to serialize data, you just serialize the schematic, serialize the type declaration, and then just dump your data. And since most of us are using 64-bit little endian machines, and uh, our compilers behave the same toward uh, laying out structures in memory, you will most probably be fine in reading the binary data back. If you're not fine, if the data, uh, if the data layout would change in your, when you're reading the data, you just define new structures and then massage the data. You just uh, fit the data path through to the new data structures. So, Um, for example, we can imagine a game save and load uh, system working on die structs, based on die structs, working on the same idea just presented about saving the binary data. When you're saving megabytes of game world that is almost contiguous, almost in the same data structure, in the same root data structure, fixed size mostly in memory, uh, oh, I should remember to talk about variable links arrays there. You just serialize the structure of the data. You serialize the ID of the structure, the fingerprint, the hash of the structure. You serialize the schema, the metadata itself, and then just dump the data in binary, or compress and dump. The general purpose compression would do real fine here. Uh, that's just save. It's fast, it's easy, it just works. Given that your data is describable by die struct, you, just, you don't need to, act to be able to access the data. You don't need no accessors, just describing the data structures in die struct. For loading, you read the ID, the hash of the, the structure of the data that you've written that before. If the ID, for example, the, your world data is called world data type, you just, uh, you have another world data type in your die struct system, in your registry right now probably, which might be different from the one you use to serialize the data. But if it is the same, if the ID of this type you have right now is the same of the ID of the type you wrote down, you wrote in on the disk, then you just read the data. It's just reading by, you're, 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 you map the data in memory, you M map the data. That's even better, depending on what you wanna do. Otherwise, if the IDs are different, it means the type has changed. And when the type has changed, it's usually just added a, uh, 
you probably have added a field, removed a field, renamed a field, rename is hard, but anyway. You just, as you can imagine right now, you can think it's not hard, you just create some finders for the new data inside the old structures. Your new data structure has added a field called new field. There's no new field in the old structure. You just create a finder for new field in the old structure, and since there is no new field in the old structure, the new field finder, accessor finder, would return zero, for example, if it's a, or return false for a Boolean or something, any default value you've set up. And uh, you just read the data. Read the data through the accessors. It's slower, surely, because you have to go through the accessors. But it can, this generation of accessors and finders can be done uh, pragma, pro, through the program. You can do, the, do, it, do this automatically. You can create accessors to change any data to the same data is slightly changed. You, have, you probably need some heuristics, a special code, things for your own use case, but it can be done. This time, your read will be slow because you're reading data one field at a time, but if there's sub data in there, you can binary read that. But the next time you save the data, it will be in the new format, and you did not, you did not much to port the data to the new format, and you will be fine. This, is, this changing of data formats is rather rare even in dev, de, de, during development. In releases, probably, it never happens, so you'll be fine. So that was it. This is a, there is an implementation of this. It's old, it's uh, wrong, it's, it doesn't cover anything. Most of the things I've said here, it's slow, but it's available if you want it on GitHub. Uh, there's no maintenance there. I've, I've just uploaded some code a few years back there, maybe two years back, I don't know. Uh, my own, my current implementation is uh, 3,500 lines of code. Uh, it has customizable allocation, customizable asserts, it has hashes, serialization, deserialization of structure data, finders, not many finders, but some finders, uh, many accessors. It's not a large thing to write. You can take the idea and write it yourself. I do not have much time for questions, sorry. I went over time already, but if you have questions, maybe one. Uh, you can ask your questions in Farsi, I will translate and then. شاید شما حالا مثلا اینو مشخص کرده باشین در طول ارائه ولی گفتین مثل استراکت های سی دیگه این دای استراکت اگه پوینتری داشته باشیم به محل ذخیره سازی این اطلاعات میتونیم اون رو مثلا کست کنیم به سی استراکت هیز اسکینگ ویدر وی کن کست سی استراکت تو دای استراکت اف یو هاف اور دی ادر وی اراوند اف یو هاف دی دیفینیشنز اف یو هاف the declarations in the struct of that structure, of those structures, and you know what types they are? Yes, you can. It's easy, because the layout is compatible. There is no safety. I have not been able to write uh, good uh, checking code to make sure that this, my layout is exactly compatible with C's layout, with compiler's layouts, but it mostly is, is. You have to check it manually if each time you define if that's important for you. ببخشید این فایندرایی که گفتین اگه مثلا ما اون ممبر فانکشن رو در واقع اشتباه وارد کنیم این ارور نمیده به ما دیگه درسته He's asking whether finders would uh, return an error on the name of I, I think you mean member field member but, data but, not but, member function uh, I, I've written them that way that's how I, I have written them but you can do any finders the idea behind finders is that you add your own types and accessors too. You add your own types. Each of them is 10 lines of code. You just write whatever you want, specific accessors for specific things. Any important questions? Does the changing the order of the members uh, makes new type? Yes, it does. 
It's, it's a new type. Yes, it's a new type. Or it's the name of the members and the order of the members and the alignment. Anything is, everything is, is, is contributes to the hash of the type, mm. the ID of the type. I'll be here. Thank you. Uh, for any, if, if you have more questions, thank you.